Well, good evening to each and every one of you. It is 6 o'clock. I was hoping I had that right. Welcome. We are so glad that you have joined us tonight. And uh, we're going to have a great time singing uh, songs of praises and to our, our Savior and to learning and reading from the book of Genesis. So we're glad you've joined us. Let's stand together as we sing. As our praise team makes their way up, let's sing. this. I want to be close. I want to be close, close to your side, so heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above, singing as Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives away, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, 
There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still. And know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we know that you are with us. This is your temple. This is where you dwell in Christ by the Spirit. But in order to dwell with people like us, you had to make us fit. You did that through the Son of God. You did it through his all-sufficient work. The great I am became man and humbled himself to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And yet he was exalted, having satisfied your divine justice on sin. He was exalted in his resurrection. He was exalted in his ascension. And Father, we desire to exalt him in our worship this morning or this evening. We pray that your spirit would lead us. We need your spirit to attend to our worship, to our praise this evening because we come weak and needy to our task. May you be glorified this evening, the great I am, through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of Christ as your people, the redeemed, worship the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And Father, if there's any here today who do not know the great I am in a saving way, may the night be the night. They come humbly, repenting of sin and trusting in your provision for sin, the Lord Jesus Christ, whose name we pray. Amen. Well, good evening. Uh, It is a special night uh, to be together with each of you, and um, and we're kind of getting back in the, the swing of things with, uh, with Genesis and having our, our youth choir back. They were off a couple weeks. How about this youth choir? Isn't this awesome? Yeah. yeah. We are uh, actually, we had to add, uh, let's see, so 12 chairs uh, tonight to fit them up there. So that's a, that's a good problem to have. And, uh, and so um, that's a great problem to have. So we're so excited to have them uh, leading us uh, this year. This is kind of their, their kickoff for the year. Um, uh, we would do want to welcome you and just make, draw your attention to something in the, in the pew in front of you. If you're a guest or if, if you're a home folk, uh, there is a card in the pew in front of you where you can fill out um, just information so that we have a record of you being here, but also if you're a guest that we can contact you and just um, let you know that we're so glad you're here with us. And, and also on the back is a place where you can put prayer requests and we pray over those on Tuesdays with our equipping staff and uh, we would be honored to pray with you on those requests. So you can fill that out and place it in the offering plate a little later. I do want to say uh, one thing, um, but, uh, but Sophie has been playing, you've been playing, Sophie has been our college women's director for uh, two and a half years, I guess, right? But also I've kind of called her our artist in residence on the violin over here. And, uh, and so, but she is moving and we mentioned that this morning with Katie Clark and, uh, Katie, if you could pull, start playing violin, that'd be great. <laughs> uh, just next week will be fine. Just if you could work on that. But we, we're going to miss you sitting over here. Chad's going to miss you. He's really enjoyed you in his ear right there. That's been great. So, but, uh, but I did want to say that. I know I wasn't supposed to. I mean, I, nobody told me I couldn't, but I'm just saying. But, uh, but we are going to miss you. Thank you. Um, let's stand and greet those around us, if you will. All right? By faith. By faith we see the hand of God In the light of creation's friend in the lights of those who prove his faithfulness, who walk by faith and not by sight. By faith our fathers roam the earth with the power of his promise in their hearts. Of a city built by God's own hand. 
join me in prayer. Oh God in heaven, that is the truth that we stand in, that we walk by faith and not by sight. And your word tells us that one day, one day we will be like him for we shall see him as he is. Our faith will give way to sight. But in the meantime, we pray that you would so bless and encourage by your spirit, the people of God, that we would walk by faith and we walk by faith tangibly as we give of the resources that you have given us to steward. So I pray, Lord Jesus, as we move into this time of worship, where we take up our tithes and our offerings, would we practice walking by faith even now for your glory, for the good of your church? We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated.
You know, some songs, just you don't know if it goes with the sermon or not. I don't really care. It's just a good one. That's, you, sometimes you just got to sing them, you know? Will you stand with us as they make their way down, all right? make everything new one day you'll make everything new Jesus one day you will bind every wound the former things shall all pass away no more tears one day you'll make sense of it all One day every question resolved. Every question. And every anxious thought left behind. No more tears. We all get to heaven. When we all get to heaven. What a day.
God's people said. Amen. What a day. Amen. Well, good evening. If you would turn your Bible to Genesis chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 16 to the end. Thank you, Adam, Regen, praise team, musicians for leading us. And Adam, if the song is biblical, it always goes with the sermon. Because there's only one story, all right? So it always, it's amazing how many, how often you'll hear Sunday school teachers say, boy, my lesson fit the sermon that was preached today. That's because there's one story. It was inspired by God. And there's always going to be unity, right? That's just, only God could have written the Bible. And so we're grateful for that. Had our first BPs, MVPs this evening, five o'clock. Of course, I've been exposed to this. It's the same thing that Lakeview has done for many years, Al's Pals. But it's remarkable to see those young people taking notes. And this was a vision of Brother Al. And it's such an amazing idea because these kids are now engaged, taking notes, drawing pictures of the illustrations. I saw a picture of a man in concrete uh, today with, with <laughs> headphones on. Um, <laughs> But be careful if you ask them if it looks like you, the picture on the badge. By the way, this was designed by Clay Cox and Greg Key. Well done. Um, But I said, y'all think that guy looks like me? They said, yeah, because his hair is standing up in the back and yours stands up in the back. (laughs) And I said, well, my wife's the one that cuts my hair, so go see her. (laughs) So anyway, let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our evening. Father, thank you. You've already blessed And we thank you for the gift of song. And Father, we pray now that as we come to this passage, that you would teach us from this passage. You inspired Moses to write it for a purpose. May we uh, capture that purpose tonight for the benefit of your people. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in 410, Rome was sacked by a Gothic army that had marched down from the barbarian north. And and they looted, they had plundered this city that had stood for a thousand years. Nothing like this had ever happened. And the people were scared, they were stunned, they were shocked. Jerome, who maybe you know translated the Bible into Latin, the Greek New Testament, said, if Rome can perish... What can be safe? The Roman Empire seemed impenetrable. And he said, if it can fall, what can be safe? Well, Augustine felt the same way. And this became the reason he wrote one of the most important books in church history. Maybe you have heard of this book, The City of God. It took him 15 years to write The City of God. Uh, He uh, completed the book when he was in his early 70s, and he began it when he was in his late 50s, over a thousand pages. And the reason for the book, and the reason it's so important, is that it's a defense of Christianity to those, as he says, who prefer their own gods to the founder of the city of God. So it's a, an apologetic, if you will, For those who prefer their own gods of their own making rather than the founder, the God of the city of God. Now, thinking about the city of God begins with the Bible. And there were three verses from the Old Testament that inspired Augustine as he wrote this book. The first one was in Psalm 87. Glorious things of you are spoken, O city of God. And then Psalm 48, 1. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. And then Psalm 46, passage we read tonight, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. So his book is about this city. Um, Yet to depict this city, Augustine speaks about another city, the city of man. Uh, The city of this world. Uh, A city that exercises dominion over human beings. It has a strong sway over 
human beings, over natural human beings. So these two cities, the city of man and the city of God, have to be discussed simultaneously because in this present age, they intermingle with one another. So according to Augustine, the history of the human race is the history of two groups of people, each having their own distinct characteristics. So here's what he wrote. These are two cities formed by two loves, the earthly by the love of self, even to the contempt of God. That's the city of man. The heavenly by the love of God, even to the contempt of self. That is the city of God. And so he was thinking in terms of Rome. Rome is the city of man. It seemed impenetrable, but ultimately it was destined to pass away. The other, the city of God, is made up of every believer. Every believer in history. And this city, in spite of present appearances, will endure forever. Our text lays out the beginning of these two cities. That's what makes Genesis 4 so very important. So last time we saw Cain decided to try to come to God on his terms without a blood sacrifice. It didn't go well for him. And, and God did not receive his worship. He did not receive his offering. And his self-righteousness was exposed. He became angry. Uh, that sin was crouching at his door. His desire was for him. He did not repent. And sin does never remain stagnant. And he ultimately murdered his brother Abel. So his murder of Abel was actually a strike at God. Whenever we sin, ultimately our sin is against God. So this section answers what happens to Cain when he leaves the garden. So he is cast out of the garden. He's cast out of the presence of God because of his wickedness, because of his lack of repentance. Um, because of his rejection of God's law, because of his rejection of the sacrifice that he was to offer, what happens to Cain? Well, it might surprise us. He prospered. He prospered. That's what we're going to see in Genesis 4. Cain is cast out of the garden, and he prospers. His family line is going to take the lead in producing cities, Music and weapons and agricultural implements. In short, his line will produce civilization. It's quite remarkable as you read Genesis chapter 4. Ironically, civilization ascends even as it descends. That is what we see in Genesis 4. It's what we're seeing today. I mean... Technology is exploding. The culture is ascending even as it descends. We see that here in our present passage. On the other hand, the righteous also built cities. The righteous built cities, but they would have said with the psalmist, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build it. Well, the first city we look at is the city of man. We see at the beginning of verse 16, the ascent of the city of man. Look with me in verse 16. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So Nod means wandering. So he's wandering, he, but this is where he ends up. And so the following account is going to give us, we get a front row seat to a self-sufficient world. This is the city of man. And, and this passage is going to reveal a fundamental indifference towards the Lord, his person and his presence, even as humankind prospers. In other words, Cain at this point, is an apostate. An apostate is someone who has received the truth, 
has been raised in the truth, but has turned his or her back on the truth. Cain is the first apostate in the Bible. He will not be the last. Well, notice in verse 17, Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. Now, where did he receive his wife? That's the question that's often posed. Uh, the only explanation for the existence of Cain's wife is that she was a daughter of Adam. That's the only explanation. We see that, in fact, in chapter 5, verse 4, when it says, The days of Adam after he fathered Seth, and he had other sons and daughters. And so, this has to be the case uh, if all mankind stems from Adam. And we believe that. We believe that because you lose the gospel if you don't. And so, uh, the marriage of brothers and sisters is inevitable if the human race descended from a single pair. Now, when humankind had multiplied and this necessity was no longer necessary, it became forbidden. It became forbidden. But at this point in history, uh, that has to be the case. And so that's what we have to go with. So Cain went away from the presence of the Lord as he built a city. And notice he named that city after his son. He called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. Elsewhere, whenever the righteous name a city, it's Godward. The name is, is somewhat Godward. So, for instance, Genesis 22, when Adam or Abraham uh, is provided a, a goat in the thicket, a ram in the thicket, to, to die in the place of Isaac, they named that place Yahweh Jireh. The Lord who will provide. That was the name of the place. Uh, we see a place in Genesis where they name it Bethel, the house of God. But here, he's not Godward in any way as he names this city. Why does he do this? Well, it reflects what's important to him. It reflects what is important to people who merely live in the city of man. He names this city after his own son. It's for the purpose of Seth's exaltation. Uh, when the godly name a city, it's for, to glorify God. But when Cain names a city, it's to glorify his own family line. Now look at this name, Enoch. Uh, the word Enoch means to inaugurate, to initiate. Uh, to dedicate. It has a wide semantic range. What Cain has done, he's inaugurated something new. It's a new beginning, but a beginning that's described or characterized by independence from God. This is anticipating the city of Babel. So you could say the first city of Babel is right here in microcosm form in a city named after his son. And so this city, this culture, this society that's described here is godless. There's nothing godward about it. Uh, this city, this family is attempting to escape the effects of the curse by technology and ingenuity and human effort. And so Cain's plan here, it appears, is to create an artificial paradise to compensate for the real paradise that was lost by sin. That hasn't changed. We see that today in the 21st century. But Cain was the first. And, and their prosperity is great. I mean, they prosper apart from God. It does not fit our theology sometimes to think about that. But they prospered. But it's an empty prosperity. It's a fleeting prosperity. It's a prosperity that has a termination date. The uh, great 
18th century poet, John Trapp, said it as eloquently as anyone. To prosper in sin is the greatest tragedy that can befall a man this side of hell. Envy not such a one his pomp any more than you would a corpse his flowers. Do you get that? None of us would envy a corpse because of his or her beautiful flowers. And he says that's what we're doing when we envy a wicked man and his prosperity. It's foolish. And that's what we see here. Now notice in verse 18. To Enoch was born Irad. And Irad fathered Mahujael. You've got to pronounce these names correct to understand what the text is saying. <laughs> and Mahujael fathered Methushael. And Methushael fathered Lamech. So let's go through these names. Irad means fugitive or wild donkey. You probably have never met an Irad for that reason. But the idea here is emerging of an unregenerate family line. He's like a wild donkey. Donkeys are dumb, and this, this uh, donkey is untamed. There's no constraints. Mahujael, get this, means to blot out that Jah, Yah, is God. To blot out that Yah is God. It's a rejection of God. The name rejects God. Which it literally means to have nothing to do with God. Now, Methushael is interesting because it actually means a man who is of God. But I don't think that that necessarily means that there's a repentance here. Because if you'll note at the beginning here, several of these names in Cain's line end with the, with the word El for Elohim. That's not a coincidence. So there appears uh, that for a time in Cain's li uh, line, in the city of man, there was a parody, at least, of the knowledge of God that lingered. All of these names, or many of these names, ending with the name El, for, for Elohim, for God. It reminds me of the United States. Most of our founders were not born-again Christians. Most of them were deists. But there was, a, there was some kind of knowledge of God that's actually even now being suppressed uh, to our lament. But we see this here. But this is the kind of religion that Cain had formed with his bloodless offering. And his impact on his line was, was significant. Now Moses is going to pause for a second with Lamech. But for one thing, Lamech is the seventh generation to come from Cain. And that's important. Seven has a, has a that number has significance. The symbolism of fullness, totality. Um, he, he's going to show us here with Lamech that we have in the seventh generation the ripening of the tares. Look with me in verse 19. And Lamech took two wives. Now I'm going to come back to that, but let me just tell you, if you ever hear someone say that the Bible sanctions polygamy, that's nonsense. It's nonsense. The one who wrote that wrote Genesis 2.24, where, where he gives his design for marriage. A man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And so the one who wrote that assumes that you know Genesis 2.24. And this is a wink-wink. So as you read about the first polygamist, you're seeing it through the lens of Genesis 2.24. This is what's happening in the city of man. This is an open attack on the ordinance of marriage. Now notice Ada, the name Ada... Uh, means ornamental. Zilla means shade or seductress. Uh, it says 
Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Ada, ornamental, and the name of the other, Zillah, which means seductress. So there's an emphasis on the outward. There's an, inter- uh, an emphasis on sensuality in the last name. Verse 20, Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. So Ada bore Jabel. Jabel's name means producer. Producer. Um, And he initiates nomadic life. He initiates cattle ranching. So if you're a cattle rancher, if you like to eat the product of cattle ranchers, you can thank this man for that. So what we're reading is not only success in reproducing, which goes back to Genesis 1, but also, of, in a sense, taking dominion. They're building culture, but they're doing it in a godless way. They're doing it in a secular way, away from God. Now, a biased account, this is just one of m- m- many reasons we can assert the inspiration of Scripture is that a bias account would have given Cain no credit for the culture building. Moses is writing of this, but he is saying, we have to give credit where credit is due. Uh, Truth is more complex than that because God is going to make great use of these Cainite techniques for the people of God. So for instance, uh, craftsman uh, Bezalel, from the tribe of Judah was a master craftsman and he built the tabernacle. He, he learned that trade uh, and this trade was passed down to him from the city of man. David was a great musician and we're going to see that music was formed here in Genesis chapter 4. And so we have to give credit where credit is due. Now verse 21, his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and the pipe. So stringed instruments. So we see this in the orchestra. Stringed instruments and wind instruments were his idea. Culture is being formed. Verse 22. Zillah also bore Tubalcane. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. Now his name literally means hammer. That would be a great football player's name. I wish I'd name one of my sons Tubal (laughs) Cain. Hammer. But he was the inventor of metallurgy. So Moses here is introducing really the first industrial revolution. And it's taking place through Cain's family. They're prospering. And there's nothing inherently wrong with these occupations. God's going to use them for the rest of history in positive ways. There's nothing wrong with these these, uh, occupations. But here's the problem. And this problem is pointed out, I think, best by Matthew Henry, just the way he words it. Listen to what Matthew Henry says. That worldly things are the only things that carnal people set their hearts upon and are most ingenuous and industrious about. Here were devices, devices how to be rich and how to be mighty and how to be merry, but nothing of God. That's what we're seeing. Culture is developing. People are prospering. But it's a secular culture. It's a secular world. It's the city of man. We read nothing about God here in this particular part of the passage. And keep in mind, all of these developments can and will be used for the glory of God. But without the living God, the power for evil that can come from this kind of culture and development is beyond our imagination. We're seeing it even in the 21st century. So these three brothers we just read about dominated the godless line of Cain. Again, Jabel, Jubal, and Tubal. 
And all of their names stem from a root that means to produce. They have produced. It reminds me of the men and women in our culture who prosper at the work of their hands. And their bank accounts are large. Their success is remarkable. But they're godless. They're secular. We see it here in Genesis chapter 4. They founded an age of discovery and were the pioneers of prosperity and power. Now, notice in the second part of verse 22, the sister of Tubal Cain was Nema. Now, her name means pleasure. So, this is pleasure apart from God. Hedonism, godless hedonism, is developing in the city of man. Verse 23 Lamech, so he comes back to Lamech. Lamech is the seventh generation. And Lamech is a special kind of depravity here. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. Sounds like a Johnny Cash song right here. I've killed a man for wounding me. A young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamex is 77-fold. The Greek translation of that is 70 times 7. We'll come back to that. Lamech is the first vigilante. When you see vigilantes in the church, it's the spirit of Lamech. Do we see vigilantes in the church? Yes, we do. When someone hurts someone else and they seek to strike after them in whatever form that is, it's the spirit of Lamech. God does not honor that. So here we have the first vigilante, and he kills a man for wounding him. And that's how vigilantism is. Because in the law of retribution, which is what God's law is grounded by, there's proportionality to the crime. The, the punishment for the crime is proportionate to the offense of the crime. You never see that with vigilantism. And so we see here the first vigilante. He is a brutal man. He is a killer. And God's law requires proportionality. Sadly, revenge serves as the first song in the Bible from fallen man. It's a song about revenge. Isn't that remarkable? And it becomes so natural for us after that to revenge ourselves. Why? Ultimately, revenge reflects I don't trust God and his justice. That's behind the spirit of revenge. Donald Gray Barnhouse, who was a wonderful pastor in the mid-20th century, had a, a national uh, radio show on CBS. He he was in Philadelphia at a wonderful Presbyterian Street Presbyterian, I believe is the name of the church. Maybe you've heard of James Montgomery Boyce. He was one of the predecessors of James Montgomery Boyce. He describes Lamech as saying, because the God of the universe, who is supposed to be running things, didn't run them to suit my fancy, but permitted someone to offend me, I have erased that offender from the face of the earth. You see, when we feel like we have to vindicate ourselves when someone hurts us, we are saying, I do not trust you with justice. It's a, it is a Godward offense. It is a Godward sin to play the role of the vigilante. So only seven generations from Adam, uh, from Adam here, and that's a complete number, and sin has come, in, has come to full fruition in Lamech. Now, next week, what's interesting, we're going to see the line of, of Seth, all right? And the seventh generation of Seth, and this is intentional, I believe this is absolutely intentional, is another Enoch. So in the seventh generation of 
Cain, we see he inflicts death, Lamech. In the seventh generation of Seth, Enoch doesn't die. So there's an intentional comparison. We'll see that in Genesis 5 next week. So here we have the city of man. It hasn't changed. You can't improve on it. You could put perfume on a pig, it's still a pig. The city of man cannot be improved upon. Okay? So when we see our culture devolving, it should not concern us. Uh, it could burden us. We, we, can, we can lament godlessness and all of these things, but we should not be concerned in the sense that we think God is somehow less sovereign or less in control or less enthroned. It's always been the case. That brings us to the ascent of the city of God. And we'll just look at this briefly. We'll come back to this next week in Genesis 5. So we've seen the ascent of the city of man. And now we see the ascent of the city of God. By the way, as believers, we're the citizens of both cities. And it becomes complicated, doesn't it? When the city of man is godless. Notice we in verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again. And she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring. Or that word, you could translate seed. It's the same word that's found in Genesis 3.15. The seed of the woman. The offspring of the woman. Instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. So clearly, Adam and Eve are walking by faith. They are trusting in the promise of Genesis 3.15. And so she names her son appointed one. Seth. She believes that the seed is going to come. The offspring is going to come through Seth. She's right. She's right. Again, Barnhouse, Lamech and his civilized lawless family are never heard of again. Think about that. They prospered for a time. They prospered. They looked, they looked so successful. They were worthy of envy from the human perspective. They're never heard from again. Okay? In the space that follows his song of the sword... We must see the rising waters of the deluge which devoured them all. The flood's coming, in other words. It has a term, the city of man has a termination date. They were ungodly, and their ungodliness brought the just recompense of its reward. They were blotted out from under heaven in order to teach us that the day will come when the judgment fires of God will do the same for the entire creation. Sobering words. And so when we as the, the people of the city of God see the people of the city of man prosper, it's like flowers on a corpse. Okay? Well, notice in verse 26. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. And I love this last line of chapter 4. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. What a hopeful last line of Genesis chapter 4. So Enosh means weak or faint one. I think that's intentional. It seems to signal what mankind is like in a post-garden frailty. And so Seth is very aware of humankind's condition on the earth. But for the people of God, for those who are truly believers, here's what it does. It provokes dependency. It provokes worship for those with faith. So I want you to think about this. Cain's line pioneers cities and culture. From the human perspective, they look really successful. Seth's line. Pioneers worship. Worship. In fact, the word call upon there, they called upon the name of the Lord, regularly means proclaimed in Moses' writings. So they called, they confessed the Lord, 
but they proclaimed the Lord. That's what believers do. The one we confess is the one that we, that we also proclaim. So that word can mean both. And so Seth's line began to make proclamation about the Lord. These people were unsung from the world. You ever feel unsung? Well, you are. We are. They were unsung from the world. From the world's perspective, they accomplished nothing. They invented nothing beneficial to culture. They simply lived for God. That's what Moses is communicating to us. This was what they were known for. And, and so the narrative here, this chapter describes the first affluent society, which is self-indulgent, self-gratifying, building cities, building culture, building civilization, but doing so in defiance of the one who created them. And in the middle of this kind of world, who's the original audience? Israel. As they're making their way into Canaan. In the middle of this kind of world, God called the original audience of Genesis. The nation of Israel who would call upon the name of the Lord and proclaim his name. And that is the same vocation entrusted to the new covenant people. Sure, God's people can advance and they can use culture. They can advance culture. We, we have people here. At Lakeview, we're godly people who have, who have really played major roles in advancing of, of you know, different kinds of uh, technology and, and other means to benefit the city of man. For, exam for example, later, uh, the Holy Spirit will come upon Bezalel and he, he will be a master craftsman building the, the tabernacle. But he's doing it for the glory of God. And again, like I said, David takes this gift of music that was Passed down from Jubal, and he will write so many of those psalms. So he's writing songs for the glory of God, not uh, for secular means. Now, what's interesting is this Canaanite culture is picked up in Revelation 18. We're going to close here. But in Revelation 18, we have the great and mighty Babylon. Like the Roman Empire looked impenetrable, but it will fall. And the merchants of Babylon in Revelation 18 provide the things that people live for today um, instead of living for God. So in Revelation 18, verse 12, for instance, cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls. But then we see the implications of living purely for the city of man, for Babylon Revelation 18, 14, the fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. That's the city of man. But here in a text that really spends the most time centered on the godless city, the city of man, it ends with a ray of hope. And that ray of hope is the bringing of a child in the world. His name is appointed one. His name is Seth. And Seth would be the far-off grandfather of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You'll be able to trace the offspring of Seth all the way through Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Judah and David, all the way to the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Additionally, uh, this seed of Seth will not take revenge. He will receive the vengeance that belongs to us because of our sin. And what he will teach us is that you don't have to bring vengeance Vengeance is the Lord. So when Peter comes to him and says, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? Up to seven times? Jesus says to him, and many scholars believe he's hearkening back to Lamech in Genesis 4. I do not say to you, but to seven times, but up to 70 
times seven. So whereas the seed of the serpent promises unlimited revenge, the seed of the woman champions unlimited forgiveness. But that kind of forgiveness has a solid foundation. And here's the foundation. Paul gives it to us in Ephesians 4. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another. Not like Lamech, just as in Christ, God forgave you. So what Moses is seeking to do, he is seeking to guard the people of God from walking in the way of Cain. Don't be allured by the city of man. It has a termination date. Your mandate, your vocation is to continue to call upon the name of the Lord and let the chips fall where they may. And for those of you uh, tonight who have never called on the name of the Lord, you've never, there's never been a time where you were born again, you trusted in Jesus as Savior, uh, we'd love to give you an opportunity. So as Adam and our musicians come forward, we're going to have pastors here at the end of the aisle, maybe you would just like to pray or like to talk to us. What does that mean to call upon the name of the Lord? Just know that the Son of God, the greater Seth, the far-off grandson of Seth, has come to set us free from the power of the city of man so that we might live prosperous, fruitful, joyful lives in the city of our God. Won't you come as we sing? Thanks for worshiping with us today. If you felt the Lord leading you to respond today, whether that was to receive Christ for the first time or to take your next step in baptism, or if you have a prayer request, we want to start that conversation with you. Visit lakeviewbaptist.org slash contact to get in touch with one of our pastors. And as always, you can stay connected with us through our social media and website.